Fantastic. Um, hi, everyone, and um, warm welcome to our startup fundraising webinar. Um, my name is Clemence, and I'm the head of marketing at Runway. We have uh, very exciting discussions coming up about startup funding, trends, and um, strategies that you can leverage to maximize your chances of getting funded. Uh, but first, I just uh, wanted to give you a, a very quick introduction about Runway uh, right before we kick up that event. So you can get to know us better. Um, at Runway, we do two things. The first thing is we provide all-inclusive workspace uh, membership for tech companies right here in San Francisco. And we give our members access to a bright, wide open space, quality events, and a direct connection to our network of experts and investors to help them grow their business. And the second thing we do is corporate innovation strategy services. We basically help global companies um, like Fujitsu, like IBM or Lenovo to navigate the trends affecting them, identify growth opportunities, and leverage relationship with uh, startups to build success, right? Uh, if you're interested to learn more, you can just head over to our website, runway.is. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce you to our CEO, Sandy Miller, uh, who also happens to be our moderator for today's panel. Hi, Sandy. Hi, thank you, Clemence. Thanks for getting us started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, we have a terrific panel for uh, our discussion today uh, on startup fundraising. And um, our goal with this uh, session is to really get practical, to really focus on some straight talk and, um, and get you some um, real takeaways that you can apply to trying to um, you know, increase your chances for success with fundraising during what I think we can all appreciate are pretty, um, uh, pretty wild times. Um, so one, a couple things just to mention on a housekeeping basis as we get started. Um, first of all, um, we are recording this session and um, we've found from the events we've been doing that people really appreciate that and they actually go back and listen um, because there are often a lot of pearls, um, really key insights and takeaways. Um, and so you'll have that uh, to go to. We'll post, we'll share that link out with everybody. The other thing is that there uh, at the bottom of your sort of Zoom screen, there's a QA and a uh, button. You wanna use that to ask questions and, maybe, and make comments and engage with each other and, and also our panelists. Um, don't use the chat room, please use the Q and A. Um, and you know, as we're going through our, our discussion, our panelists will try to jump in on, on that thread and, um, uh, and answer some of your questions. And certainly we'll be monitoring that thread to um, sort of tee up any of the, pull some of those questions and uh, incorporate those into our discussion. Um, so, and the other thing we're going to be doing in just a few minutes uh, is um, a poll. So we have just a few questions um, that we'll be asking you uh, to complete about your thoughts about fundraising, what you're trying to fundraise uh, in terms of amounts, what, you're, what you see as challenges, and then um, we'll show the results um, of that poll a little bit later in the discussion. Um, so to get started, um, I'd like to introduce our, our awesome panel, and um, we have uh, Heiyu Huang with uh, Fresco Capital, Faz Bashi, who wears several hats, but among them, he's the lead venture investor with the Femtech Fund out of the Portfolio Group, and Daniel Strachman with the 1517 Fund. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists, just to um, give a, a bit, a brief intro about themselves to talk about their, you know, what areas are they, do they like to invest in? What's sort of the general stage um, that they like to invest in startups? And then uh, maybe share a fun fact about themselves. So we get to know them uh, a little bit better. So to kick things off, uh, Hoi, why, don't, why don't you help, why don't you start with an introduction? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, this is Hui from Fresco Capital. 
for an early stage firm that investing at the intersection of people and technology, global wise through offices, San Francisco, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. So um, area wise, we are uh, interested in the vertical about learning, working, and living. So education, future of work, and also digital healthcare has been our focus. Stage wise, we kind of first take a size in two seat and following two theory B for that. Um, and fun fact, so uh, often I'm actually my first name is very hard to pronounce. I often just ask them to like, just call me hey you. So like sometimes getting the first sentence grading like hey you, yeah. So that's kind of like fun fact. Great, thank you. And Faz, uh, tell us a little bit more about you and your investing activities. Thank you, Sandy. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I like just simple things. So healthcare and life sciences, and that's my area of specialty. So um, I invest in human health and also now in animal health. Um, in the particular areas at Portfolio's Femtech Fund are obviously related to women's health and wellness. So I'd love to see more deals that come to us for very complex issues related to women's health, whether it's endometriosis or pain issues or um, menopause. I mean, things that are really touching women's lives uh, on a regular basis. Uh, a fun fact about me, um, I used to be a cartoonist and we'll leave it at that. That's great, thanks. Yeah. Didn't know that, I love it. <laughs> um, and Danielle. Hey, uh, thanks for having me so much, Sandy. I'm from 1517 Fund. I'm a general partner and co-founder there. We predominantly work with student founders who are uh, starting a business instead of going to college. So my colleague and I ran the Teal Fellowship Program for the first five years back in 2010. And we saw some really extraordinary outcomes from that. And we decided to repackage the fellowship kind of like a venture fund. Uh, and we did that five years ago. We write a 250K check into a pre-seed company. Um, areas of focus, our first fund, we focused uh, 25% on hardware, 25% on B2B SaaS, and 50% kind of opportunistically across. We've done everything from app companies to a quantum computing company. So um, we get to learn all kinds of new stuff every day. Fun fact about me, uh, I like to draw, but I wasn't a cartoonist, but uh, I was a animal trainer in a previous life and I have a cat and she knows six tricks. So yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, I will reciprocate um, on the fun fact thing. Um, and so, and, and I'll keep in the animal theme um, that's, that we seem to have. And so I have a little dog named Lola and Lola listens. She runs to the TV when she hears the commercials with other dogs in the commercials. Oh, oh that's so great. She, and she gets very excited. So I don't know other dogs who do that. So yeah. that's my that's my dog, Lola. Nice. Um, anyway, um, so thank you guys. Um, so um, let's kick off the poll. So I'm going to ask you guys to do two things. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A window, questions for our panel. Um, and then we're going to start talking, but um, let's launch our poll. And, um, you know, some of our, these are, they're just five questions, just sort of your timing and amounts for funding, fundraising, how much money you're looking to raise, um, who you're looking to raise it from, that sort of thing. Um, so you guys get busy on, on these questions and just scroll up here. And then we'll show you um, we'll show you the results in a bit. Okay, so um, just so we get a sense of sort of what you know how each of you whether you're investing as an angel individually or with your firms, can you just talk about our whether you're investing during COVID and may, and if you have maybe share a recent investment that you guys have made? Um, let's see, Danielle, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah, happy to go ahead. Um, for 1517, we have done Zoom investing for a long time. Um, we're a remote team, uh, sort of naturally as it is. And so this has been a sort of a natural progression for us, albeit a lot more of it online than we did before. Uh, in fact, I think it was the second week of COVID and, and when we were in sheltering in place fully uh, in mid-March, we made an investment in one of our first ed tech companies, actually, we don't do very much in ed tech investing, but we invested in a company called CoLearn Club, uh, which is to help parents to be able to homeschool at home. Uh, and uh, we're just doing another investment right now. We just committed to a company that's working on remote internships. 
Um, so we do about one deal a month. We expect to keep up with that pace with that 250K check and go from there. So yeah, we are, we are in the saddle fully. Terrific. Um, Hoyu, why don't you, why don't you talk about your investing activity recently? Yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, we're also kind of a global distributed team. So actually, actually looking at the deals, actually from the deal flow part, there's actually more deals because like a lot of the activity is getting more virtual for that. We haven't been kind of doing too due diligence with the company, but haven't made a new investment. Most of the investment we being made is with the portfolio companies. So either of the follow on or some of the uh, kind of the initi initiatives that are looking at. So is it just to make sure we're understanding that you guys are actively looking for investments now, you're not letting COVID sort of, you know, hold you up from investing, you're just sort of continuing to look for the, the best yeah. deals. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. And Foz, how about you? Yeah, we're very much like Danielle. We've been uh, with the portfolio Femtech Fund. We've been from the very beginning Zoom oriented and that's how we make our investments. Uh, a lot of it has to do with relationships that we've had in the past before. Uh, a, a deal that we just recently did was Bone Health focused on mobile support for women who have osteopenia and basically want to have treatments at home and it's a wearable device and they're doing really well. So um, yeah, and you know, another note, I, I run a monthly call for the Angel Capital Association for Life Sciences, and I've been doing it for the past five years. And I have to tell you, healthcare and life sciences, uh, one of the positive effects of COVID is now people really make it a number one priority and no one has really stopped looking in that space. Terrific. Um, so, so this is interesting because you guys have, you know, pre-COVID, you were already doing a fair bit of this through Zoom and, and online. Um, but I think, so one of the questions is, can you speak specifically about, you know, does that mean that you were already doing investments into companies before, where you hadn't met, um, you know, the founders, the, you know, executive team in person? Um, is there any sort of change for you? Can you just help us understand that a little bit more deeply? Because I think that's a big question that a lot of entrepreneurs have is, is whether investors are even considering that and how that's going. Um, let's see, why don't we start with uh, Foz this time? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the caveat is actually the majority, if not all of the deals that we've invested in through Zoom have come through warm relationships. So somebody, somebody that we know and somebody that we trust, either on the board or is already an investor, um, has introduced us to the deal. So while we may not be able to meet the entrepreneurs in person, we have a connection in. And so that creates the basis of, um, of, of the comfort in writing checks. And I think it, for, for uh, most uh, groups or family offices or venture funds, that, that kind of connection into some some element of relationship has to exist. Terrific. Um, how about you, Hoyu? Yeah, um, since Fresco is actually global distributed at day one, so we are happy to actually make an investment before actually meeting in person. Um, actually, in our portfolio company, we have a company called Grains, and before the COVID, actually several years ago, we made an investment. They're based in Singapore, and we made the investment actually before meeting the team and currently also on the board and they're actively supporting company uh, during the uh, period as well. Great, and Danielle? Yeah, for myself, I've been sort of racking my brain because I'm sure we have 50 companies that we've funded over the last five years and I'm sure there's at least one where we met after we made the investment, although I can't think of the exact group. But there've been many companies where we've done a lot of Zoom calls with them and then maybe met once either in the past or once in the present. Um, so it's pretty typical for us. I think a, a difference for us is that we do get a lot of warm leads from people, but we also do a lot of cold contacts as well. So we have a contact form on our website that asks people questions about what they're doing. Um, that's a, like one of our premises is that we build relationship with founders over time. So the worst case scenario is when a founder comes to me on a Wednesday and says they need money by Friday. That's not really what we do. Uh, and it's not what a lot of early stage investors do. So you wanna start talking to them earlier than that um, and building up that ability to show them that you can execute, that you can build that team. And so for us, 
Uh, we do a lot of mentorship, especially since we work with students. And so that's our way of getting to know people. So it's not so much about like the pitch meeting, it's about that relationship over time that we're building with a founder, whether through an intro from somebody else or through our contact form. Great, and, and sort of building on that point, um, Manny, can you go to the, the next slide? Um, you know, this thing about how much, um, you know, runway, uh, you know, cash, a lot of the, the startups have in hand. And, you know, I think this is something that, you know, startups are always trying to run lean and mean. And there's, there's always that, you know, timing, right, of and, and managing your burn. I mean, one of the things that's, that's this is some data that I, th I thought was helpful from um, the Startup Genome Project that has done a pretty extensive series of surveys um, about the impact of COVID. And, and these are global surveys. Um, and so, you know, almost a third of the startups globally, again, that they surveyed uh, had less than three months of cash left. Um, and then the effect of COVID is that they went, that went up um, to 41%. Mm -hmm. Again, that's at a, a global level. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting here is um, that even those companies that are little, that are post series A, B or later, a lot of those only have about six months of cash runway left. According, again, that's globally, um, but it's a pretty big data set. And um, so I'm curious, as you guys see these numbers, you know, Danielle sort of shared her experience. Um, what, are, what, what are the conversations that you're having with startups who are caught in this crunch of, of timing and so forth? Um, um, you know, because I'm sure that this is, I know that this is sort of a challenge that a lot of them are navigating. Um, Foz, you want to take a, a crack at that? Yeah, and and I'm I'm also in a startup company myself. So I'm on the board of directors. I'm an investor. I'm an advisor, but I'm also rolling up my sleeves and actually doing work in a company. And these stats are no different than where we are as well. Um, the the distinguishing factor here is we're all entrepreneurs, and so we believe in what we're doing. And so you go full force, believing full well that with time and the relationships that you've built along the way, the, the money will manifest itself because nobody wants to walk away from a good opportunity. So, um, so, so there's a question also in the Q&A, which is how much earlier should founders reach out to investors? So you know what? We, we all want to know what you're doing. We all want to get to know what your progress is. And if it's too early, we'll let you know as early and then we'll stay in touch. So early as possible is fine. A lot of folks do want to track what's going on with the companies and uh, cash is an important factor, but what's even more important these days is profitability and revenue. So again, if you're showing traction, if you're showing that the marketplace wants what you have and you're showing a ramp that, that shows sales are growing, uh, those are factors that get people's uh, attention, investors' attention. Great. Hoyu, other thoughts yeah, on this? Yeah, just kind of building on what Vass mentioned, I think the wrong way there's different factors for this topic. So one is what kind of categories you are in terms of vertical. Some of that is actually capital intensive, some of that is more kind of capital efficient. And then whether the vertical, how they be influenced by the calling. For FASCO specifically, since we're investing a lot into education, future work, and digital healthcare, actually majority of our companies um, are fine, or, or even actually they're getting more and more kind of like um, the, the revenues and also scales because of the COVID. And then um, another kind of factor for that is what is the business model? So I think in general, a lot of portfolio companies and companies, I think they need to think about um, runway and at the same time, what is the growth scenario? Like, and also how do you plan your scenarios in the different runway situations? At the same time, what some strategies, what some approaches you can actually adapt to protect your runway. And at the same time, I think uh, runway is not only because of the COVID, there's also a lot of macro market timing issues. So um, actually at Q3 last year, we've been kind of writing the content and also within our portfolio companies to mention that there's something maybe to actually think beforehand. So I think there's different factors, but at the same time, uh, in general, have a scenario analysis, and then based on your categories, really have a plan for different scenarios uh, would be something um, I would suggest to our founders. Great. 
Danielle, do you have anything else to add? Or? Yeah, a couple of things. So one thing that I want to differentiate here is that early stage funding is going to like pre A funding is going to be different than like series A and beyond funding. Yeah. And I think a lot of pre-seed and seed investors are very into relationship building and want to hear from founders earlier and get those conversations started. And uh, you know, like Fa said, everyone's going to have sort of their litmus for when they go into diligence. Ours happens to be when companies are in a pilot or two. That's when we say, okay, we're going to go into full diligence and pass the, the relationship building stage with this company. Um, but for our companies, one thing that we told them starting about maybe a year and a half ago or so is that for Series A, until you have that million in ARR, we say don't bother to talk to Series A funds at this point. Because what we've seen happen is that founders get kind of boxed into that first meeting in terms of their traction and, and the investors thinking, oh, well, this is really early. They don't have this, they don't have that. And then even when they go back later and say, hey, how do you like me now? Somehow the mental model <laughs> still gets boxed into that first meeting. And so I don't know what's happening. Like, I don't know why earlier stage investors seem to, I think maybe for us, like we understand that the beginning is where it starts, which is basically nothing. But I think yeah. for series A investors, it starts at having that million in ARR metric for many industries across the board. Um, so we've advised people that you got to focus on your metrics and traction because you could burn three months or six months of fundraising when you're not ready to be fundraising, but you don't know it because you're not in the VC seat, you're in the founder seat. Great. Lots of great insights from each of you guys on there. Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things about our, our new reality is that in the past, startups and investors would meet, would meet each other primarily um, either through, you know, referrals, introductions, but also at events, right? And those aren't happening these days. <laughs> and it's hard to, you know, so, so I'm just curious, how has that changed for you? Because you guys care about, you know, meeting great startups, just as much as startups want to meet you. Um, so how has that changed for you uh, to the degree that it has? Um, how do you, can you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, sure. I think I'm like, in terms of volume, it's actually getting more compared to before. Like <clears throat> for Fresco, um, as Kama Sass and Daniel has already mentioned, a lot of that for early stage investors coming from warm intro. So it doesn't really matter where you're located. We're still getting the deal flow from the warm intro from the founders, um, some of the investors as well. And another kind of phenomenon we noticed is a lot of the events has already had the virtual uh, version of that, or they be thinking about building digital communities. So it's actually easier for investors to access if they're active in the ecosystem or so in the specific vertical to know what's going on there um, and also actually having conversation with the founders early on. Danielle or Foss? Yeah, I was gonna jump in with that. Um, for us in particular, uh, we meet our founders in kind of strange ways. It took me a while to catch on to that many founders and investor relationships started these like big events and we met at South by and I've always avoided that kind of thing to me. It's like, I don't know, it's a big party, not really interested. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, especially since we work with a very particular demographic and, you know, mostly students and uh, first time founders and things like this is that we go to campuses a lot in hackathons and you would think that, oh, well, that's not going to be going so well right now. And in some ways that's true because we can't meet them in person, but they're, I'm doing virtual hackathons, virtual office hours. I can do two or three virtual hackathons in a weekend and I can't do that in person. And so I actually have found I've been able to introduce myself to more people, take more intro calls and things like that because I'm not traveling. Uh, it actually has been sort of to our benefit. We've also been doing 15, 17 events on Friday nights. We do 15, 17 at home. Uh, and we've garnered 200 people coming to different talks about math education, um, we've had one on governance, like all different areas. We had an intro to chess, uh, and that's been really fun to engage our community. And we've been putting stuff on Twitter and getting new people involved. And so we're finding that our outreach efforts have been very helpful uh, and that we're able to meet people. And like I said, we have our contact form. So anybody who you know wants to reach out can do that. Or my email is right on my Zoom here. So just reach out. Great. So I was just going to riff on something Danielle said a little bit earlier. So not every investor is the same and not every class of money is the same either. So be careful, even though you can have more meetings, she's absolutely right. You know, um, and especially when you get to the A level of investing. So in my world of healthcare and life sciences, every year at JP Morgan, 
that ARR value that she mentioned keeps changing. They mm -hmm. keep moving the goalposts. It was one million one year, then it was two, then it was five. At some point, they're going to say, don't even bother, right? <laughs> so be careful who you take meetings with. Not everyone is the same. Not So again, try to build your network before you need it. Talk to people before you take those meetings. Make sure it's something that you you can get some flavor of who the person is behind that screen. So there are ways to tell what people are about, even when you do this type of Zoom thing, right? I happen to have a puppy dog back here. That says something about me, right? Yeah. Yep. All right. Go. I've got an art table right over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, so let's drill down on that because I think this is something that, uh, particularly for first-time entrepreneurs, is is one of those things where they really struggle with, you know, how to approach investors. And this is, of course, was you know was an issue well before COVID. And, and so now, um, you know, because all three of you have so much experience in engaging with entrepreneurs online um, and, and virtually, um, what's, what's sort of, you know, what's some of a, can you share an example of like a, a good example of, you know, uh, an entrepreneur sees you on a panel on, on, on something like this? You know, is it the email outreach? Is it the, you know, connecting on LinkedIn? And, and what, you know, try to get as specific as possible for, hey, if you're going to reach out to me, what I like to see is, you know, this kind of information, right? Because I think that this is, this is something that I hear a lot from entrepreneurs. Um, so, Danielle, why don't you start us off with that? Sure, absolutely. I think um, outreaching, especially, I guess there's different ways of doing outreach. And so there's, there's, um, there's like, I, I guess I'll, I'll segment this into like the warm lead versus the cold. And so on the warm lead, you're reaching out to people who might know that person, you're doing a little bit of homework in the background to find out about them, find out if your company is a fit for their stage, learn about the types of things they invest in, um, learn about their thesis learn about the fund size, for example. Um, I think sometimes people think, oh, an investor is an investor, an investor, and thinks they can go talk to a Series A investor when they're a pre-seed company. And there's mathematical models for why that doesn't work. Um, I won't go into all the details here, but just like know your investor basically and, and the background and why you think it's gonna be a fit to talk to them and craft that into your messaging. And that messaging could be an email to them. It could be tweeting at them. Um, it could be reaching out on LinkedIn. Um, I do think it's important to show where the relevancy is, especially in the cold outreach. So I get a lot of cold emails and you can tell when it's just the spammed, like my name's in the thing. I think 15, seven, like I get this all the time. I think 15, 17 is a great fit because of the other investments you've done. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, I delete those. Like, unless I, unless I see like, okay, this person is like, they're a student, like maybe they're naive and they don't know how to do this. But if I can't tell that there's any reason that they've done any reading about what we do or who we are, then I'm not going to put in the time to find out if they've done their homework. Um, I've written a post, it's called How to Get a Killer Intro uh, on Medium with our 1517 site. It talks about like, talk about like your past history of execution, say what you're doing now and why it's relevant to that person, say exactly what you want to get out of the call. Like my biggest pet peeve is when people email me, hey, I'd love to do coffee. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to do 100,000 coffees too, but I can't. So be specific about what you want and why it's a fit. Um, and if you can do it through a warm lead, that's always nice. But for us at 1517, especially because of the demographic we work with, we don't expect them to have that kind of network yet. Okay. Um, Foz, how about you? I couldn't say it better. I don't okay. know how to add except what Danielle said. Add puppy <laughs> pictures. Add puppy pictures to add the Add puppy audience. pictures. It's a, this is a relationship business. So get to know, get to know people. And uh, I like, I like genuineness and authenticity. I like to know that you've done your research. Um, I, I like, I like to know again, why, why is it that I should respond? Um, and Danielle's absolutely right. You know, after after a given time period, after you see a thousand deals, you start to get to know what what feels right and what doesn't. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's and Daniel already kind of mentioned um, a lot of things that I've been thinking about that. But I think one specific thing, especially um, in the kind of the Zoomer time for that people, especially investors getting more and more attention to them, like shorter and shorter. 
So I would suggest for all the panel, do your homework about investor. What is the fund or the stage? At the same time, when you want to actually call outreach, be very concise about what are you doing and also what is your ask and why they're interested. You know, no matter for the email or LinkedIn for that, because I got a lot of the, the uh, requests from the founders who is a very short, a like, very long message, emails, and also the deck. I think this is actually not efficient for investors to get to know like what is the specific, um, the kind of the, the connection point to that. So that would be my suggestion for that. Great. This is actually one reason I love Twitter. Like I didn't start using Twitter until about a year ago and I've met so many wonderful people off there because you can interact with someone a little bit in like a low touch way. You can see what they're interested in and then you can connect with them further. And I've probably met something, I probably met at least like six founders off uh, Twitter in the last few months. And it's been really great. So like I highly recommend that platform to kind of do some of that relationship building in a nice soft touch way. Uh, and then sort of uh, I don't know, escalate the relationship from there. Yeah, okay, great. Um, Manny, can you show the next slide? So again, one more thing from that's sort of interesting and, and speaking to sort of what's really happening out there um, are term sheets. And this is sort of the experience of startups that had a term sheet, you mm -hmm. know, before COVID. Um, you know, about 20% had the, that sheet pulled by the investor, um, you know, about half of them, you know, pro the process is slowed or even as far as the, the lead, you know, you work so hard to get your lead investor and lead investor stops uh, being responsive. And um, the good news is, I guess, is, you know, nearly 30% things have sort of proceeded uh, normally. So it, this is sort of a, a mixed story. Um, and I guess, you know, in terms of, for, for each of you, as you think about, um, you know, term sheets and valuations, um, you know, how, how are you, if you are at all, sort of changing your approach or what do you see, you know, there's sort of the reality of, you know, the market for a particular deal, right? So, how is that really affecting, you know, your considerations as you're thinking about extending a term sheet now, right? Um, Hoyu, why don't you speak to that? Yeah, I think I'll first briefly mention before, I think for us, it's actually um, be consistent, but um, in kind of the process, a lot of things is how do you actually reach the valuation, and we're definitely putting more thought in terms of the traction and also the path to the profitability. Um, and also doing more due diligence in terms of getting the information and also knowing the founder more. So that would be the process um, in terms of the term sheet for us. Great. Foz? Yeah, you know, um, I, I don't see our process really having changed much COVID or pre-COVID or post-COVID. Um, I do see, again, we're, we're not, we, we look for good deals. We look for great opportunities to work with amazing entrepreneurs. Um, if all those factors are in place and there's a motivation to get something done, the deal will be done. Um, and we've had that happen time and time again, whether it's a seed financing um, or it's a series C. Uh, so in portfolio, we invest up to series C. Uh, if there's a good deal and it really makes sense and the growth opportunity is there, we're going to get into it and, um, and not hold back. I guess what I would add to this is just that, um, you know, as, as early stage funds, one of the things that we all have to think about is what's happening up the stack from us. Um, so we have to think about what are valuations going to look like at the Series A and at the seed round, and then how do we adjust accordingly. When we started 15-17 in uh, 2015, there was a bit of a market correction in terms of uh, rounds. And for us, it was our it was our first fund, and it probably took us maybe like four to six months to catch up to it. And so we have some, some pre-seed companies who are in the first fund who are easily at like a 10 or 12 million cap. And, that, and then we had other companies who it's like a 4 million cap. And it took us a little while to learn that the market had shifted. And so one of our biggest learnings there was that we had to catch up to the market or even anticipate where it was gonna go before it went there. And so one of the things that we think about when we're doing deals right now is what's going to happen at the seed level? Like, you know, what valuations are we hearing? So we're doing a lot of homework on our side to talk with investors who are at the seed and the series A level to say, 
you know, hey, we know you can't predict the future, but like if you look in that crystal ball a little bit for us, what do you think you're going to see? Because the worst case scenario for a very early stage investor is that let's just scenario something out that we come in on a deal and for us, it has the uh, pilots that we want. The founders have the characteristics that we're looking for. We've built a great relationship over time. But if we say, oh, hey, um, you know, we'll do a, a 6 million cap on this, let's say, but then a whole year later, a seed investor comes in and says, yeah, the market of startups right now for the traction they have now is 8 million. Then it's like, okay, we have a small bump on that. But in a way it's, I, I've often sort of um, articulated this as that that investor is getting to bank off our risk which is really sad and unfortunate. Like as a pre-seed investor, what you wanna see is that there's a doubling effect or a tripling effect at the next round, doubling effect ideally at a minimum. Um, and so we think about that a lot. And so like we have seen valuations come down. And so we've been articulating that to our founders as well to say, hey, maybe pre-COVID, this would have been like more around five or six, but what we're hearing from seed is that it's gonna be hard to go above eight and so that means we are thinking this is somewhere more in the three to four range, given what the market is like. And what we don't want our founders have to do is to work so much harder and get so much more traction to be able to be attractive to a seed or a series A investor later. So that's how we try to inform ourselves is to be very in touch with what's happening ahead of us. That's great. Thank you. Um, so let's shift to take a look at the poll the results from the poll and see where people are. Um, so when people are, so uh, about half of people are looking to raise in within about three months, um, about 23% now, that's a good spread. Um, and then we have how much people are raising. So we have a mix yeah, so the sweet spot of between like 300K um, and, and almost a million is the, the sweet spot for the group. But we have some folks shooting for more, um, uh, 3 million or more. Um, so lots of diversity in here. Um, Can I throw out some caution for those three month people? Yeah. My prediction is that COVID's going to get worse again in the fall. And I think things are going to lock back up a lot more. And I think people are going to become more conservative again. I think right now we're in a little bit of a acclimation phase where people are like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got this, I'm doing it. I would try to strike right now while the iron is hot. I think waiting three months from now, you're, you're going to ideally have more traction, but we don't know what the state of the economy or like health in the world is going to be. And it might be really hard to raise in three months from now. It's not to say it's not hard to raise now, but I, I, if, if those three monthers are thinking, oh, I have a little time, you don't have time. Go get the money, guys. <laughs> okay. Take those trees. Yeah, in a smart yeah, way. And also kind of, and also kind of beating on Daniel's side, because I, I also came across some founders, they were just um, hesitating about, should they actually go with the smaller round at the stages with a note, or do they actually should be waiting for a larger round of that? I um, agree that um, I think there's a lot of uncertainties actually ahead that in the coming few months or so that. So we actually have a good balance about maybe having some of the cash flow at short term. And then for valuation wise, either way, when the kind of macro market, the time gets better, and you can have like high valuation um, that time, or should be actually thinking about other alternative interest and creative financing way to increase your uh, runway as well. Yeah. There's an old song lyric that comes to mind, which is, I think it's, I think it's go take the money and run. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> go with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just so, going to add, I'm just going to yeah. add one more quick thought, which is I'm, I'm in a very niche vertical area, right? So it's healthcare and life sciences, human or animal. So it's a very tight knit community. Uh, almost everybody across the United States that does stuff in healthcare life sciences, there are several of us who are like super nodes. We all know what the valuations are. We all know the same deals. Uh, it's a very limited space. So again, yeah, uh, be careful how greedy you get in this marketplace because as people see your deal and they start talking to one another, uh, you really want to be in a position where your modesty in this time frame is really your humility in this time frame is showing through rather than your greed. 
Right. Um, how, how much are you seeing uh, some of the entrepreneurs that you run into sort of pursuing other activities to bridge themselves through these lean times, like maybe consulting, you know, to sort of trying to ge generate some revenue through consulting services or, or other approaches? Are there sort of what? <laughs> if, I, if I happen to see them in an Uber and they're driving an Uber and they're running my healthcare company, I will definitely have some questions to ask. I mean, honestly, in my at least in my space, I'm going to let Danielle and 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 hear you uh, answer that question separately. But in my space, they have to be 100%, 200% dedicated to the business. Now, on the side of it, do they have other business models? Uh, for most of us, we like to see them cleanly in one area which is either they're gonna be a consulting business or you know, or a SaaS based model or whatever it is, not a multiple set of business models. It's too distracting. Great. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Empower myself, Empower was actually starting with the side business. A lot of the founders have been for the alternative financing option to actually increasing the runways, like working capital financing, revenue shares models with different capital providers. So I would highly suggest founders looking at some of the different capital providers they all having some different open program during this timing um that maybe there's a fit for you to not only kind of go with the equity funding but there's other way to increase your runway great yeah to to chime in on increasing on runway what we're seeing with our teams who are already active is they're staying lean they're not executing on the hiring plans that they you know uh were setting out to do at the beginning of the year we have had teams who have had to do layoffs um, for teams that are coming into us new, they're usually bootstrapping, which does mean that they might be doing some consulting on the side or something like that. I think uh, the population we work with might be lucky. I work with a lot of Gen Zers, so I've had a lot of pitch meetings and people are like, I'm in my mom's house. And I'm like, that's kind of amazing. Um, so I, I always say your family are your first investors, whether it's monetary or support in other ways. And so I, I do see a lot of sort of creative strategies of, um, younger people going home right now and and that just being a totally normal thing. Yeah. So if, if anybody, that'll help, I think people feel better about having to do that. Um, yeah, you're being, you're being capital efficient by moving back in with parents. <laughs> so yeah. just to finish off looking at the... Too. I'm like, I wish someone were cooking for me. That would be amazing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to finish off looking at the poll. So... Um, so one of the biggest, uh, the majority of people said that identifying who is investing during COVID is, came out as the top challenge. Um, and that I, I you know, so I, my, my guess is that is about, hey, doing your homework and reaching out and meeting people can, like you find folks. Can, can Other I thoughts add, about that? Yeah, I just, I just have a quick thought on that. So, you know, the, People do a lot of revisionist history when they look back on success, right? Facebook and Google and YouTube, revisionist history. It's not really the way it happened. So you might think it's lucky they were at some cafe someplace and all of a sudden somebody showed up with a bag load of money. It's not. There are a lot of people behind the scenes in a successful company who are opening doors. Hence the reason for having advisors Hence, the reason for having some governance and maybe having a board if you're ready for a board, but having people who believe in you have cash, have advisory role, have mentorship opportunities, because multiple things happen when you ask people for introductions. Great. You know. Yeah, I think, um, and also I think one specific, uh, maybe tips or questions to found, because I know there's still a lot, still a lot of investment and founder meeting happening. It's to understand what is the cycle of that fund life cycle of your investors they are in. Because um, if they are actually more income follow on, so actually time for that, they have the, the, the cost of different portfolio construction for that, so they will have different priority in terms of actually deploy their capital. So mm -hmm. I think kind of like understand what is the specific position of your investor you're pitching at will actually save your time and also identify whether they're actually in a position to actually sell them. I would actually also um, go so far as to say you can ask some very specific questions because in my brain, if someone said, oh, are you investing, but you're doing follow on capital in your companies, you could still like tease yourself into saying yes on that. Um, so I would ask people things like, 
When was the last new investment you did? When do you anticipate the timing of your next new investment? And like, be very specific. And I think it's totally okay to ask those types of questions. Great. So we have folks who um, have, um, I think relatively, um, you know, they're in the better sort of zones in terms of um, their available, um, available cash. Um, and so the, the good news I think is that while they um, have more cash is that they're taking the time to sort of be thinking about, about raising. And I think there's been some clear um, takeaways here. Um, in terms of um, motivations for fundraising, um, wow, so we have product development is the highest, but um, you know, new hires, marketing and sales, uh, which has to do with scaling up things. Uh, and then just sort of funding normal operations. Um, so those are, those are good. All right. So one of the things that I want to follow up on here that was mentioned is uh, on the challenges is that the second most um, uh, common cha challenge uh, polled was about a strong pitch, um, you know, and, and really concerns about how to craft that pitch. Um, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, we, it seems like there are waves where sometimes there's sort of obsessiveness about the perfect pitch and then, you know, and then it's more about the team and, and, and all of that. But, um, you know, you guys can particularly um, with all of your sort of online work with, with startups that are pitching to you, Help us sort of understand, you know, from what are some of the things that um, an entrepreneur who hasn't done a lot of online pitching, what are some of the adjustments that they should make just in, in how they pitch, how they handle the session? Because, you know, doing that in this sort of format is very different than sort of the dynamic that can come to play when you're face to face in, you know, name your conference room. Um, so Foss, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, you know, uh, again, there's a lot that you can tell about people, whether you meet them in person or you see them on a camera like this. Now, I can't reach beyond these boxes here and, and shake hands with anybody, uh, but I can get a sense of who you are if you let me, right? If you're acting, then it'll come across if you're not comfortable with the medium of Zoom or any other online platform, then what should you do? You should practice. You should make sure that you record and make sure you know that perhaps your eyes should be pointing in one direction or another, or maybe you should have a background or no background. Make sure your voice is coming across properly. Make sure your connections are good. So all of those logistical things that you didn't have to worry about before, you do have to worry about it now because it's frustrating from everyone's perspective when the meeting doesn't start on time. Can you see my presentation? Can you hear me? So, I mean, a lot of these things will be taken care of over time when new innovations and new Zooms show up. But I think it's important to understand the medium in which you're trying to paint this story now. It is now in the confines of this box. So figure it out and figure out how to make the lighting work for you, make the voice work and storytelling still happens right here. Great. Yeah, I was gonna actually jump uh, yeah, Daniel, off of, go ahead. Off of go ahead. that because um, uh, I'm a really big fan of thinking of this frame as frame control. Um, and so, yeah, you get to showcase what people see and, um, you know, lighting matters, the connectivity you have matters, the sounds around or in your home matter, the type of dog you have matters, like all these things show up. But one thing we've seen for some of our companies, and you know, I know a lot of companies are working from home. We have a couple companies that are essential services, but even as things open up more and offices open up more, I do think it's gonna be more Zoom intro meetings, maybe even Zoom diligence, and then they'll be, okay, now we're gonna write a check so we'll meet in person. And so I think there's something, and we've had, we have a founding team who did this, or you know, some of our founders did this, where uh, they're an essential service, um, and they're called Hamama. Uh, they, uh, they create a microgreen 
kit for the kitchen. So they make it so you can basically have a garden in your kitchen. So no matter how much you know land you have, you could have zero land, you can grow food in your house. And they had a pitch recently where you know, I told the founder, I said, you could have second meeting optics in your first meeting because you don't have to just sit here. You can pick up the laptop and walk people around your warehouse and show them these are the staff we have. Oh, here's where we do fulfillment. Oh, here's where we do this. Most investor meetings, you're going to the investor's office. They're not seeing anything about you. So use this time to your advantage. And then the other thing I would say is learn to Zoom facilitate. It's really important. If you have a team on, if you're three people and there's one investor or something like that, someone on your team needs to understand how do you pass the baton and say, hey, Sandy, I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna talk about such and such next. And hey, Foz, you're gonna talk about this. And you gotta learn to do that so it's really smooth instead of it always being this like jolting thing. And it's not that hard to do. Um, just think about it like presentation skills overall um, and just you gotta fine tune it. That was that was definitely a light bulb moment. Did you see yeah. the light bulb turn on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very nice, Danielle. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm gonna get a light bulb. I'm gonna be like the light bulb just went off. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah I was just adding to the uh, still coming back into the attention spam I think about so content wise back into the first principle uh, being very clear about what is the problem you're addressing and also how you actually um, kind of like think about a solution in different scenario being thought through about the process I think really investment to get to the point I think another part kind of for the social norm in the new digital ages is just being more intentional cautious about the interaction with the audience uh, being cautious about the questions what it get that so I think that would be um, my kind of the key suggestion about um, the presentation for pitch meeting. I've got one more little thing, which is that if the people who you're presenting to have their cameras on, turn your cameras on. Do not have your camera off. I had someone pitching me. It was a cold email. I took the pitch and they had their camera. They had, it was them and their co-founder. Their co-founder had the camera on. They didn't. And I was like, so are we doing audio or are we doing video? And they're like, oh, we'll do video, but I'm going to keep mine off because I'm not showered yet. And I was like, I don't really care if you're showered or not. You should have your video on. Like, yeah. Why would you prepare for the meeting? Were you going to show up unshowered when we had a coffee break? Oh, no, I <laughs> right. I know. I know. I, yeah. So if the cameras are on, you're on camera, period. End, right. of End of story. No question about it. That's right. So one of the things that, um, another question that I've, I've heard entrepreneurs sort of pondering about with regard to their pitch is um, given the uncertainty, right? <laughs> that, that a lot of companies are facing, you know, we're all facing these days and we've talked about, um, you know, that there's uh, uh, more than a good chance that there's gonna be um, a resurgence uh, later this year how should entrepreneurs speak to that in their forecast, their, their, their timeline with, and, and sort of still look credible? Um, Cause they, you know, I think they're, I see people sort of swinging very wildly on and, and really struggling with what to show you. Right. And how to, how to tell that story given that all the uncertainty. So I, I, can I just start really quick? So I know in this uh, unusual um, stage of our society and everything that um, um, it's uh, truth telling the truth is really important so I'll put it that way right so don't make up stuff if if the economy is hurting it's hurting everybody it's hurting me it's hurting you so and if it's affecting your market in this quarter or the next quarter and you see a resurgence later you know what tell us I I'm not looking for somebody who is a used car salesman or salesperson I'm looking for someone who can really kind of point me in the way of a novel innovation in healthcare or life science and animal health and human health and whatever, and then show me that there's a pathway that we're going to succeed together. And that means that you need to tell me really the truth about your opportunity today and tomorrow. Great. One thing I'll add there is that I think for a lot of companies moving forward, especially new companies, early stage companies, um, you know, pre-seed, seed level, is that a lot of people are out there because COVID has opportunities that are inherent in it, whether it's in remote work or it's health tech or something like this. Um, and uh, even in terms of automation, there's a lot of different areas. And what I'm seeing is that people are using the same deck that they had in February now. 
you can't do that. Like you must address COVID. You must address how your product is going to be affected by it, whether it's better or worse. Um, you have to have a couple of slides in there about how you're going to be in this new place. Um, and to address things like, you know, what's going to happen in the fall. I mean, I think what you just want to talk about is that your team's going to be really lean. You're going to do more with less, but you want to show it. You don't want, just want to tell it. So you want to have that in your numbers, but you have to, you have to have a COVID slide in your deck of like, here's what, how it is. Or one of our companies is in robotics and they're fundraising right now. And they showed us their deck. And I was like, you are actually better in this environment and you're not your problem needs to be like we're doing all this cleaning and it's even more important now given covid and here's how we accelerate all of this and they just they weren't even thinking about it so you have to address it fully great yeah and also i think um for as early investor i think at the end of the day we're all investing founders mm -hmm. and the, for the people one of the a very important characteristic is the adaptability we all know this is also a changing world for that, and also how the founder react to that is very important. As Daniel mentioned, kind of the coding slides, like, oh, how the things you are building is actually like kind of like towards about coding training for that. But I think like for that specific, I just also have one good topic for that, because a lot of the founders are being too optimistic, like, oh, this is a COVID and this is something coming up. But if this is something you have been working on for a long time in the past, great. We know being passionate about the problem, you have the experience for that, but don't be too optimistic. At the same time, I think for um, kind of how you're showing that, one um, actually matrix or framework I came across is very interesting. Because I think for the uncertainty, there's two parts. One is something as a macro market, something you can change. So having kind of one matrix that's like, oh, this is a different scenario about how market, macro market gonna go. And then another kind of dimension is more about how you're gonna adapt that uh, for kind of expands, for kind of revenue for that. So having this two part together a different scenario, what your metrics gonna be look like. Then your investor know that you have been thinking through about the scenarios and you already have a plan under different um, scenarios and options as well. Then we know you've been really kind of be prepared for that. Great, thanks, Hoi Yu. Um, so for all the uh, attendees here, I just wanna remind you, we're gonna, um, in a little bit, if there are more questions, we're gonna op we can open things up for Q&A, so put your questions in there. Um, but the, we're getting great stuff from this uh, amazing panel, so while you guys are doing that, we're gonna keep charging in. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm wondering about is how, you know, how among investors, um, you know, your peers, how has syndication changed, if it has at all? Is that, is that much of a, are you seeing much of a COVID impact on how you syndicate with other investors um, and how they syndicate with you? There's more, there's more of it. So, so we were, we were already on that pathway, I think since 2008. So I started actually investing as an angel uh, in 2008, 2009 timeframe. So that was a weird time. It's like all of a sudden, all the parties stopped. Everyone was very serious. It's like, what's yeah. going on? Oh, the economy just crashed. Oh, okay. Um, but slowly but surely that competitive stuff that we had in the past, pre-2008, went away and people became more collaborative. And now syndications, and it's not COVID only, it is people are collaborating more and more on the investment side of things. And syndicating more often and now we also all realize how important it is to maintain the relationships that we have through phone calls and zoom sessions and other things and reach out to one another earlier than we have in the past so it is there to stay it is uh strong um especially in the angel and micro vc environment terrific yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of collaboration as well. And um, especially at like the pre-seed seed stage, it's it's rare that at that stage, someone's take, it's not like a series A where someone's taking 80 plus percent of a round. So I think uh, as a group, we've all been more collaborative anyways. And this is only bringing that out more. Like I even do a once a month call with other pre-seed investors, not to talk about deals, but just to be like, hey, how's this new environment going for you and checking in. And so we're all, I think, getting each other's backs right now. Cool. Yeah, definitely seeing more collaboration and comparing notes for that. But I think for syndicate, it really depends on what types of investor they are. If they're institutional investor, they have the fund, then they have a kind of 
construction in terms of the size, and they would just continue doing that. But if it is like family office or specific individuals, or um, they have maybe other portfolios being hit by the public market a lot, then maybe they're being more cautious in terms of how do we actually allocate different portfolios. So for founders specifically, when they're seeing kind of syndicate, really understand what types of investor they are. Um, I think that's really important. Great. Um, so this is this is a time for you know if you were to wave your magic wand and you know get the the most exciting deals coming to you, um, what are what are some of the industry sectors or technologies or you know what's sort of your your dream wish list for some of the areas that you're so excited to consider investing in? Um, hey, you, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, I think that's the one topic that we're very interested in is actually living city. Because I know it's been kind of a topic, a lot of the physical space uh, in the city is being transformed as the system changes. So we've been looking forward to a lot of the solutions that are actually creating the new systems for the city in terms of like infrastructure, in terms of workforce and wellness and education as well. So this is um, the category I'm particularly interested. Great. Pause. This is a great time to be an entrepreneur. So um, I, I, I still love the healthcare space and I love life sciences. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, women's health and wellness is a huge topic. It is growing. 50% uh, or more of the world needs products and services that just don't exist today. So keep innovating in those areas. Um, I, you can tell I'm, I'm a big fan also of the animal health space. So uh, whether they're pets or they're you know, animals that are in our various industries. Uh, I'm all about that. I think that area is going to be uh, booming. It already is booming. Removing antibiotics, all natural, everything you want for yourself, you also want to make sure go into your pets and your animals. Mm. Terrific. Danielle? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, like, in terms of sort of the environment we're in and, and areas of investment, I think if I were... Um, someone looking to solve problems right now, I would start thinking about just different industry areas. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the mission-oriented founder, someone who's having the experience themselves and solving it, um, not for like the glory of being a founder and entrepreneur, because there is no glory, especially not for the first few years. It's, it's We always say you have to be willing to die on your sword uh, at the very beginning. And so think about the things that are really important to you that are problems that people are facing. I'm seeing a lot of creativity coming out right now. I think the constraint of the world is also making people creative and thinking about new things and thinking about the future of work and the future of learning and all these different areas. And so I would just, I would urge people to, uh, especially like early stage, or if you're like at the kind of scratching and itch idea stage, just think about, you know, what do you think the world is going to need in the next couple of years and how are you affected and how might you be primed to start working on that? Awesome. Thank you so much. So let's shift to open things up um, to our attendees for some Q&A. Uh, Manny, can you tee us up here? Sure. So the first question is, what's more important in a deck showmanship and an interest in presentation or facts and numbers? Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both. <laughs> Do you want to jump in fast? Do you have more to say there? You know, so again, this is another thing that being an entrepreneur is hard. You have to know everything about everything. And if you don't, you have to know who to go and ask. So research your audience, make sure you know your audience, make sure you know if you're dealing with clinical folks, if you're dealing with business folks, then make sure that at least you start your story from a perspective in which you're engaging. I don't like showmanship actually. I don't like flash and, and, and that kind of stuff. I, I prefer someone who can uh, pull a thread and keep me engaged on that thread and don't let me fall off in some sense, right? So whether, you know, if I have to ask you a question, I've already fallen off that track. So I prefer a good story that just pulls a nice thread along and I can continue listening. I wanna listen. I don't wanna be entertained. Some people like to be entertained, I don't. Yeah, I would say kind of focus on the problem stating you're really trying to solve and everything else is or actually just backing the problems um, that you're mission driven, you're passionate about and you're doing for that, including data, including um, the, the metrics framework. But really kind of the focus is what you're exactly solving. 
Uh, yeah, for us, it's, um, I think by showmanship, what I mean there is just that you've done a little bit of work to make your deck readable, legible, um, nice to look at. It's helpful. I always say that investor brains are pretty like ADD squirrely. And so uh, to Faz's point earlier, like you want to keep our attention focused. Think of your deck as marketing material to get that first meeting. Um, different people will give you different advice about whether to send a deck ahead or after. Oh my God, I love the squirrel. <laughs> There it is. There's a squirrel. ADHD brain. Um, right? brain. Be like, oh, look, there's a squirrel. squirrel. There you um, go. But um, for us, we've also written a really long post. It's called the Anti-Pitch Playbook. We're actually not a big fan of like traditional pitches. And so we wrote a 30-minute medium post about it. Um, but yeah, that narrative and story plus data to back it up is a great combo. Um, for us, we want to know, again, why you're willing to die on your sword to do something. So we want to hear that sort of origin story. But we also want to know that that problem that you faced is also something that is relevant to a larger group of people since this is venture capital and, uh, and man, that puppy's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> you know that something's going to scale. I know. You can't, you can't, you can't lose with I, I love it. I'm like, oh, on I'm cute lose. animal pictures. That's no. terrific. No. Well, and on that note, I think um, you guys have been just so terrific. Um, Wait, and it's I over? Think, you can't I end think, it now. Well, yeah, I think you guys have had such great, you know, such great okay. answers that um, you've answered a lot of the questions that the folks have had. Um, so just as a reminder, everyone, um, we will be sending out uh, the recording to this and um, and please, you know, I know you guys are also busy. So thank you so much, hey you, Foz and Danielle, for taking time to be with us today. And um, we wish everybody uh, success in startup fundraising and in finding good good investors to invest in great companies. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having.